After spending a year in the opposition, former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a dramatic comeback in last week's elections. Together with his far-right allies, Netanyahu was declared the victor, having secured the necessary seats to avert the political deadlock that paralyzed Israel for the past four years. Netanyahu, who is also embroiled in a corruption trial, vowed to work with all Israelis. Negotiations are already underway on forming Israel's next government. Netanyahu's Likud party will look to collaborate with three far-right leaders who are expected to want ministerial-level posts in exchange for joining a coalition. Netanyahu's victory caps off a chaotic period that saw five elections in just over three years. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says he wants to maintain ties with Israel based on mutual understanding. Over the past year, Turkey and Israel saw relations rapidly improve with high-level visits and the reappointment of ambassadors. But will that momentum continue under a Netanyahu government? And to discuss what Netanyahu's victory could mean for the region, joining me now from Tel Aviv is Arik Rudnitsky. He is a researcher on Arab politics in Israel's Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. And from West Jerusalem, Nimrod Goran. He is the president and CEO of the Mitfim Institute, a foreign policy think tank based in West Jerusalem. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So, Arik, what do you make of the election results? Are you surprised? Well, I believe that the right wing uh, gained uh, the upper hand in these elections, but actually a close look on the actual votes reveals the fact that it was almost a complete neck-to-neck -neck draw between the uh, Netanyahu camp and the Lapid camp as we see that approximately 2.3 million votes for each camp actually uh, supported each camp. But in the uh, final results, uh, two parties representing the uh, Lapid or left, uh, right, left centrist camp failed to pass the electoral threshold. And this is why uh, the right wing led by Benjamin Netanyahu uh, got the upper hand uh, so, in, in the mm -hmm. final results. So Nimrod, what was behind Netanyahu's stunning victory and his likely return to power? It's a combination of processes that happened within the Netanyahu bloc and within the bloc that opposed him. And Arik mentioned the fact that some of the parties that uh, opposed Netanyahu did not manage to cross the threshold. A party, there was an issue of parties not being able to coordinate between themselves within the anti-Netanyahu bloc like they did well last time. And on the other hand, Netanyahu's bloc managed to mobilize voters that did not go out to vote last time, partly because of the far-right extremist party of Itamar ben to who appealed to a certain sector of the society, and also to the ultra-Orthodox party Shas, which managed to bring out the vote in a better way than it did before. So those two processes in each of the camp led to a result in which there is a quite a significant dominance of right-wing and far-right-wing uh, voters or mm -hmm. members of Knesset in the next parliament. So, Eric, how has the election results been viewed by Arab leaders and the Arab community in Israel? How frustrated are they uh, because of the election results? Well, the bottom line is that they are very frustrated from the results. But actually, uh, the election results are good news and bad news at the same time, because the good news is that two parties managed to pass the electoral threshold. And all in all, the Arab representation in the Knesset will uh, be the same, uh, 10 members on behalf of the Arab parties. But uh, at the end of the day, one important part representing the more nationalist orientation in the Arab community failed to pass this electoral threshold. Now, it is no secret that the Arab community is highly tense and actually uh, a bit worried about the rise of the extreme right-wing parties as part of the future uh, Netanyahu's uh, coalition, but actually they count on uh, Netanyahu conduct because uh, it appears that Netanyahu appears to be uh, the leftist uh, pillar of this uh, future coalition. Now that uh, Netanyahu would not need their support to form a uh, government, Nimrod, have election results strengthened Netanyahu's, uh, Netanyahu's hand in implementing his program and plans on Palestinian lands without any obstruction? I think that's part of the problem that Israel will face in the coming years, because in previous uh, governments led by Netanyahu, he used to bring on board a party that was more moderate uh, of, by, from him, uh, taking concern about the international image of his party and how to engage better with the pro-Western or liberal communities. 
Now the motivation is different. Netanyahu is in a personal mess regarding his legal situation, and his number one priority may be to get out of that. Uh, to do that, he will bring on board only parties that agree to a legal reform, uh, domestic changes. And those are the far-right uh, parties that are not more moderate on foreign policy issues. So Netanyahu mm -hmm. has a carte blanche basically to go forward. I'm not sure he'll go all the way uh, as he intended in the past on annexation and similar issues, but definitely we'll see more people doing provocation from within the coalition and more danger of escalation in the West Bank. So, Eric, are you expecting any dramatic changes in Israel's foreign policy? For example, how would Netanyahu's return to power um, affect recently normalized ties between Turkey and Israel? Well, speaking of normalization, indeed Netanyahu presented itself to the Israeli public as the father who gave birth to the Abram Accord between Israel and Arab countries. And in this regard, we may expect to see more of the same when uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, even Tunisia may be, may be coming next. Now, as far as normalization is concerned, indeed, Israel and Turkey experienced some kind of a new honeymoon in the relations between the two nations. And we expect this to uh, continue. I don't think that the Netanyahu, Netanyahu himself or the government will try to uh, undermine this relationship. But there's one thing, and this thing has to do with the status quo in Jerusalem, and in particular in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, when mm. we know that President Erdogan established himself as the Muslim leader who will try to defend and promote the issue of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, while we, have that, we know that some elements within the future coalition actually want to uh, bring back a uh, Jewish presence in yes. this uh, compound. Yeah, the, the president, the Turkish president said he wants to maintain <clears throat> ties with Israel based on mutual understanding. So, uh, Nimrod, what's your take on that? I mean, what are the challenges for uh, maintaining these normalized uh, ties between the two countries? We can take into account uh, the past instances in which relationships were led by Netanyahu and Erdogan on both sides. And remember that the leaders did manage to reach an agreement in 2016. It didn't last long. And the issue is uh, on both ends. Uh, engagement is possible. The interest of uh, maintaining the normalization process definitely still exists on both sides. But prospects for negative developments, whether in Jerusalem or Gaza or West Bank, uh, are on the rise. And when that happens, it will be more difficult for Turkey and Israel to continue uh, their bilateral relationship. And the composition of the government that has far-right actors make it more difficult to maintain better and good relations between different ministries and different uh, governmental entities. So the goal is to diversify, not to let Israel-Turkey relationship be only about Netanyahu and Erdogan and the ministers, put a push to bring forward academic cooperation, civil society, business, uh, liberal uh, groups working together to make sure that it's not only about the leaders and there is a safeguard that can help relationship uh, be mended in case that political tensions resurface and most likely they will. So if we leave aside Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem, uh, Arik, um, when he was prime minister, uh, Netanyahu had shown a strategic alignment with Greece and the Greek Cypriots when it comes to energy security and uh, diplomatic development. So will he continue his previous policies, for example, regarding the tensions in eastern Mediterranean, or if he is more likely to bear in mind this latest normalization process? We can expect that uh, the Netanyahu government will respect the uh, most recent agreement between uh, Israel and Lebanon regarding exploiting uh, mineral and, and gas uh, uh, resources in the Mediterranean. We can expect that the Netanyahu government will try uh, to foster and uh, present itself as uh, business as usual in the MENA uh, region. And in this regard, we do not expect any, any uh, future disagreements uh, between Israel and the other nations uh, in, in the region. Uh, the, I think that the problem lies uh, far beyond the uh, MENA region with, uh, with regards to the relations between uh, uh, Israel and Iran. If you mentioned that Turkey is one pillar, then Iran is another pillar. And in this regard, we can expect that Netanyahu will return to its uh, former uh, diplomatic effort uh, to present uh, Iran as a root of all evil for the Mediterranean. Mm. So, um, Nimrod, prior to the elections, Netanyahu has also vowed to uh, neutralize the historic maritime deal with Lebanon the same way he did the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians. So does he pose a threat to this landmark deal between the two countries? 
The agreement with Lebanon was one of the achievements of the outgoing government, which really had quite a significant number of achievements on foreign policy issues. Netanyahu initially did say that he will go against the deal and cancel it, but that message disappeared from his talking points quite early on. So I do not expect Netanyahu to go against the deal. The ability to leverage that deal to more regional progress, I think, is now questionable. So we may see a status quo or an attempt by Netanyahu to maintain the status quo without a lot of ability to uh, reach breakthroughs in the region. We already heard uh, the messaging from Jordan, very much concerned on the inclusion of far-right parties in the government. It reflects the previous tensions between Netanyahu and King Abdullah in his last term. Those are the things we should be concerned about, and the role of the Americans and of the Europeans in safeguarding those agreements, especially the one with Lebanon, I think it will be an important one. So, um, Eric, do you think he'll maintain Israel's status quo on the uh, current Ukraine conflict? Because there has been a pressure on Israel to help Ukraine to defend itself against the uh, Russian aggression. So um, will the new government supply Kiev with, for example, defense technology or it will rain, uh, remain neutral? I think that Israel tries to remain neutral as far as the... Uh, Russian conflict or the uh, war in Ukraine is uh, concerned. Uh, we know that there were under the table uh, efforts or uh, I would say uh, communications between uh, Israel and, and Russia. And actually Israel is, is, between, is between the two sides here. And in this regard, I don't think that uh, the Israel as far as open and, and a, a real, real uh, foreign policy is concerned that Israel will take any any uh, uh, firm uh, measures uh, on this on this regard. Uh, I think that Netanyahu will try to restore his good relations with uh, Putin. We know that the two leaders had uh, personal good relations uh, in the past uh, terms of Netanyahu's government. And on this regard, we can expect that they will try to uh, return their good relations as it was before. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.